Well, there you are. I've been looking all over for you. Thank you for joining me again for another installment of There You Go with Brian. Uh, I was sitting around this weekend thinking, where could I take you today uh, for our little adventure? And I hit upon the idea of something that I have held in my back pocket for the last 53 years. Kept telling myself, that place looks interesting. I'm going to go there one day. And today, you and me, we're going. If you've ever had a fascination with things like bone saws, dissected cadavers, and iron lungs, apothecary stores, things like that, well, this vlog is for you. Today, we are going down to Lakeshore Drive to see a one-of-a-kind museum. It's entitled the International Museum of Surgical Science. Want to go? Come on with me. Let's do it. We are out and about on the Kennedy Expressway, heading all the way downtown there. Downtown Chicago. Now, you know, as doing all the research on these vlogs, it never ceases to amaze me how many times there's a tie to my mom. And I sometimes wonder if my mom's talking to me. But we are headed to 1524 Lake Shore Drive. It's an old mansion built in 1916. Now, there used to be a lot of these mansions up and down the Lake Shore, but there are only seven of them left, and we are going to see two of them today. Uh, but not only are we seeing a, a really cool museum in a vintage mansion, but this mansion used to be owned by the Goldblatt's family, and they owned Goldblatt's department store which just happened to be the very first job my mom had as a telephone operator. So essentially, I'm kind of going over to visit my mom's boss's house. How's that for cool? Now, parking downtown can be difficult, but it's not impossible. I mean, look at me. I just found a spot one block away from the museum, so I'm all set to go. So let's go and do it wrong hat. There we go. You gotta love the Gold Coast. I tell you, I feel good every time I come back down here. I used to live down here. Can't afford it anymore, but just the architecture here is beautiful. And we really picked a beautiful day to come down to the museum. I think this is gonna be fun. Oh, you know we're getting close. You can see the lake off there in the distance. I gotta love this architecture. Just beautiful. And that's where we're going. You can hardly miss this place because they have this beautiful sculpture out front. It's of a surgeon helping a man in need. And I have literally passed by here for 53 years and I have never once stepped inside. just beautiful. FYI, just on a side note, these two buildings were put on the market for sale back in 2017. They were asking $22 million for both of them. This one right here, 1516 Lakeshore Drive, just got through selling in July of this last year for $4.25 million. I, uh, it is a landmark, you can't tear it down, but they are going, they've been using this as offices for the uh, surgical museum, and they are going to be, uh, see if you can see anything in there. They're going to return this to its former glory, uh, the new guy who bought it. I think his name is Whiten, Whiten? he's a vice president of uh, some big company, I'm not sure, it's some kind of investment company, I think. Uh, but he's going to return this to a residence. So they're going to completely refurbish this. And since it is um, a landmark property, you're not allowed to uh, change the look of it. But interestingly enough, it has nine bathrooms in here. Not one of them has a tub or a shower. So they're going to have to install all new plumbing in here. And it's called Blair Mansion because it was constructed in 1912 by Edward Tyler Blair. Uh, and uh oh uh, oh very cool right here you can see what i was talking about earlier it was briefly owned by the goldblatt's family in the mid 1940s 
pretty cool. And then they sold it to the International College of Surgeons in 1947. And this has uh, been their headquarters for 70 years. So I don't know if they're, this is actually where the museum itself is. This was the, the offices, but it remains to be seen what they're gonna do with the museum. But I'd say get down here while you can and see this, because it is very, very interesting and beautiful. Let's go inside and see what's in there. Here we go. So this is the guy who started everything, Maxwell Thorick. He started this in 1935. It was meant to be a um, hall of fame for surgeons all over the world. Okay, after 53 years of waiting, we are officially here. Now on the very first floor here, you see this old door, and it's uh, taken from an apothecary store. This is actually uh, meant to represent an old-fashioned apothecary store. Early American apothecary. I love apothecary stores. You don't run across these too much anymore. But this is so cool. Look at this. There's even a pharmacist behind the counter here. He's mixing some stuff up. Oh, what's says push the button to hear pharmacist's story. I reckon we will. Hello and welcome to the Sackett and Tabor apothecary of the 1890s. I'm Dr. Uriah C. Jones, the pharmacist. I fill prescriptions and sell non-prescription medicines, and we carry some household and personal items. But there is one major difference between your drugstore and mine. Mm -hmm. The majority of the ointments, powders, tinctures, and salves in this pharmacy are made by me. Hmm. For instance, if you require some foot powder, I can provide four kinds. There's the manufactured or patent medicine brand. I can't guarantee that one because I didn't make it. In my own line, however, I have three variations of foot powder, one to satisfy every customer. In addition, I make sachet powders, an anesthetic, a pile ointment, and a universal ointment for healing wounds, sores, burns, and chapped and cracked skin. Not to mention the inks and dyes that I make and my own line of perfume and cosmetics, guaranteed to be as fine as the finest imported French products. And if you're a tiny person, they apparently have the world's tiniest dental office here. Look at that old-fashioned dental chair. Very neat. And it's right outside the apothecary store, so he can fill whatever prescription you need filled. I think maybe we should step outside the apothecary store. He's a little chatty today. He just won't stop. They also have a lot of vintage art here that involves healing. This is what you see when you walk in the front door. Now basically what Dr. Thorak did back in 1935 is he wanted to open up a hall of fame for surgeons. And, uh, oh, here's our guy right here, Dr. Thorak. They've got a bust of him. He uh, wanted to have a Hall of Fame for surgeons. And uh, he uh, put out a call to people all over the world saying, if you have anything related to healing, send it to us and we'll put it in our Hall of Fame if we think it's worthy. And after doing that for 20 years, they uh, managed to buy this place, and this was an actual residence. 
that people lived in and uh, uh, they bought this in 1947 and they turned it into a more formal museum. See all of these very interesting pieces of artwork here on the walls. Oh my. Just take this in. And I can't believe nobody's here. Amazing to think that on these four floors, there was a family living here at one point. Oh, wow. This is the uh, ophthalmology section. Glasses down through history. I'll tell you one thing, it is definitely quiet in here. Oh, look at this. Old spectacles from the 1700s. It's amazing that these have managed to survive. Oh. Some from the 1950s, that's cool. Are you in need of a false eye? So this is what the doctor used to use when he would examine your eyes. Possibly something to take to the opera? Because you want to get a closer look at things. Oh, these are quite beautiful. Mother of Pearl. Hmm. Now imagine if you would, a disease that can attack in epidemic proportions, but no one knows how it spreads. A disease that has the same symptoms as a cold on one day and can immobilize the person on the next. That was polio. People would have to wear braces like these, use crutches. And some people would have to spend up to 28 days in an iron lung like this. It was the only treatment they had. It says the iron lung was invented in 1928 by Philip Drinker. It consisted of a large metal tank enclosing the whole body except for the head. In 1931, John Haven, a Merson, created a newly improved and more economical iron lung, which included a removable bed to more easily transfer the patient. Emerson's respirator also included windows and hand portals to allow the nurses to better attend to the patients. Here's one of the wheelchairs that they used back in the 20s. And supposedly, this was supposed to manipulate the pressure on the different muscles throughout the day, hopefully relieving some of the pain. Just horrific. Oh yes, I've heard about this for years. Now we're in the library. And look at all of these books. They're all, these are all books from all over the world regarding different specialities, as the English say. And these are all wrapped up in acid-free paper to protect them so they don't fall apart. Just amazing. I can only imagine what this place must have been like back in the day, back in the early 1900s, before it was even a museum. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> it's pretty cool looking. And right next to the library, we enter the Hall of the Immortals. This was the very first thing that they put in here when they uh, moved in in 1947. These are statues of all the founders of modern day medicine. Rontagen, Semmelweis, Louis Pasteur, 
didn't live very long, from 1822 to 1895. Morgani. William Harvey. Get you some better light here, William. Wow. Vesalius. Oh, he's got the skull in his hand. We've got Ambrosia Pere. Galen. And of course, you got your Hippocrates. Good thing you wrote everything down. I am Hoteb. Oh, nice to meet you, Hoteb. Oh, and we have Marie Carey. I didn't want to forget about Asclepius. And in case you were wondering, yes, these are the light switches here. I don't know if they're working. Oh, they are working. Oh my God. Look at that. Pretty cool. Wow. This is what they used to put on you if you had spinal surgery to keep you immobile so you could heal up. Very interesting. Having a baby today is difficult. Try going back to the 1800s. And I guess they would just put the baby there on the table there afterwards. Ooh. I find this hard to believe, but in this particular department of gallstones and kidney stones, all of these were removed from human beings, including that guy. That's as big as a baseball. Can you imagine if you had this on your coffee table and just didn't tell anybody what this all was? These all came out of human beings' bodies. These are surgical implements from the Roman times. This is crazy. Now, since this is a worldwide museum for medicine. They have different sections as well for China, and this one here I'm in is for Japan, and a uh, Japanese surgeon at the beginning of the Edo era, about 1700. That's what it was like going to the surgeon? Hmm, doesn't look so bad. Oh, I'm not sure that I have this right, but they're saying that these three guys in Japan developed ultrasound diagnoses. Hmm. Shiguro Nakajima, Rokuro Uchida, Yoshia Hagawara. The very first ultrasound. Say that old-timey surgery was primitive and unsophisticated. Say what you will but they sure had a sense of style in their dress. So this is what it would have been like if you were uh, at medical school. You'd have the professor down there in the chair teaching the class and you would be all the way up here. You got a thing for skeletons? They got skeletons. I'm not exactly sure what this is all about. It's uh, some kind of old-timey camera. Very cool looking, though. Well, it's about time they paid a little respect to the nurses. That's right. You got your Florence Nightingale, widely regarded as the founder of modern nursing. 
She came to prominence while tending to wounded soldiers during the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856. Nightingale was an early proponent of the use of wound dressing to prevent, cover, and help reduce infections. She's got a nice face. I like her. And this is actually one of the hats that she wore. And I'm not sure if this is actually signed by her, but it looks like an original. It's a pledge, basically, to be a good nurse and do a great job and save lives. Very cool. Thank you, Flo. Oh, more art on the fourth floor. Indeed. Oh my, this looks like a very early cesarean. Oh, and this is even better. They have a whole section dedicated to nurses down through history. Look at this. All these young ladies here back in 1914 watching an operation. Very cool indeed. So much here to take in. Here's an old stethoscope the nurses would use. An old nursing hat. Very cool. Oh, if you were in the army, you'd be wearing that if you were a nurse. And I don't know if this is a reproduction. I don't think it is. It's really in beautiful shape though. Look at this. Wow, nurse's uniform from 1920. I can't help myself. There's a closed door here and it says elevator. Let's see what's behind here. Look, got the old buttons. Cool. Look, it's got a telephone in there too. But this is what uh, they would use when people lived here in this building. Very cool. Okay, on with the tour. Well, they have uh, a section here for uh, artificial legs and arms. Certainly was uh, um, brought about in great number after World War I. The advancements were quite sped up after 1918. In case you ever wondered what a bear's skull looks like, there you go. And that's a lion's. Wow. That would be a horse. Well, that's going to do it for me at the International Museum of Surgical Science at 1524 Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. Come on down. They're open seven days a week. It's 17 bucks to get in with various uh, reductions in price depending on your situation and your age. But you'll have a really interesting educational time down here. It's a lot of fun. I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, it's good to get out. Nobody else is here. I'm the only one here. So uh, what can I say? But there you go. And uh, me and Flo, I'll buy you lunch, Flo. Come on. Let's go. See you next time. Bye-bye. Something old, something new, something for me, something for you. It's a big, big world. Let's check it out.